check. Good evening, I'm Nicholas Lavalley, the Town of Merrimack's Media Services Coordinator. Thank you for joining us tonight as we cover your Town Deliberative Session 2024. If you're new to Merrimack TV, welcome. Merrimack TV is the brand name for the Town of Merrimack's Media Division. Our offices are located at 6 Babusik Lake Road, the Town Hall Complex. I'm joined tonight by our Assistant Media Services Coordinator, Justin Slez, on camera, and our Media Assistant, Grace LeMay, who is back at our Town Hall TV studio. And she's bringing you the graphics that you're seeing at the bottom of the screen and also monitoring our audio and making sure that our live stream is steady. So thank you to Justin and Grace. If you're watching on our cable channels, uh, then you know that we're on cable channel six, but we're also on HD 1072. So if you want a higher res image and you have uh, the, an HD box, you can watch us on HD 1072. And we're also, we also have a streaming app. So you can download Merrimack TV, which is a free app on your Apple TV, Roku, or Amazon Fire TV device. And we're also in your device's app store on your iPhone or Android device as well. So you can watch Merrimack TV from anywhere. And I know that parents uh, and family members appreciate that because we cover so many Varsity Tomahawks games and Merrimack High School concerts. So now families can enjoy their grandchildren uh, or their nephews and nieces or, uh, uh, from across the country can tune into those Tomahawks games. So exciting stuff there. And then if you're looking for a, a previously recorded meeting, or a meeting that may have been live, we record all of our meetings and we upload them to our, the Merrimack TV streaming app. So you can watch meetings the following day on the app. Merrimack TV app is uh, it's a free it's free app and it's there's no additional login required. And there's definitely no subscription either. You can just download the app and start enjoying Merrimack TV. You're not hearing any audio from the room right now because the meeting hasn't been called to order. So we're waiting for Lynn Christensen, the town moderator, to call the meeting to order. And then you'll be able to hear their microphones as well. People will often ask, when a meeting starts and we have a, a coming up next screen, coming up next text on the screen, they'll say, how come I can't hear anything? That's why you can't hear anything. The meeting hasn't started. If you could follow us on Facebook as well, look, find Merrimack TV on Facebook at facebook.com Merrimack TV. Follow us there and we will be live as soon as the moderators calls the meeting to order. Thanks for watching Merrimack TV. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time. I'm gonna call this meeting to order. If you would please stand and join with me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and if we can keep the chatter to a minimum, that would be very helpful. Meeting's going to run the same way we've run it for the past 30 plus years. We're going by your rules. We're going to go through the warrant one by one. I will recognize someone to make a motion. We'll second it. And then that person will have the first opportunity to speak to it. They'll be given five minutes to do the presentation and then they will be shut off. Anybody else that would like to speak to that motion can come to the microphone down here. 
you'll be given three minutes to make your case. Ask questions, make comments. As always, and you've always done this for me, be polite, be respectful. These are your fellow neighbors and voters. I've been to many, many moderator meetings and trainings in these last few years, and it amazes me what some moderators have to deal with as far as the audience. I want to thank you all. You've always been respectful. You've always been polite. You've always been reasonable. We've never had an issue here in this town, so thank you. You should have a great card. It has an M on it. Guess what? That's Merrimack. If you want to speak, you need to show me that you have this card. So that tells me you are a registered voter and you have checked in. If you don't have one of these, hang on to your seat. So we're going to proceed with this. <clears throat> we obviously don't do anything with Article 1, as that is the elections, which will be on April 9th. I hope you all show up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, Finley, would you introduce your, your tables here? Thank you, Madam Moderator. I was reminded <coughs> numerous times by my wife that we forgot this last year, and so I was, yep. was going to be on top of it. But So good evening, and th uh, thank you for joining us tonight for our deliberative session. Um, I'm Finley Rothhouse, currently the chairman of the town council. Um, to my left, uh, your right, is Mackenzie Murphy followed by Nancy Murphy, Barbara Healy, Tom Koenig to my immediate left. On my right is Nancy Harrington, Andy Hunter, uh, Town Manager Paul McCallies right next to him, our Town Attorney Matt Upton, and behind me is um, Brenda DeLong, our uh, Deputy Town Clerk Tax Collector, and Diane Trippett, our Town Clerk Tax Collector. Thank you very much. And, yes, and if you could indulge me for just a moment, um, uh, we have two people this evening who have chosen to retire after decades of work for the town. They're part of our foundation over the past 30 uh, years for uh, Diane Trippett, our town clerk tax collector, and Lynn has got 34 years of service to the community. And so if you'd kindly join me in showing them the appreciation we have for all their service to us. relating to an amendment to the charter to add a student representative. Mackenzie, I believe this is you. I would like to, oh. would like to move the article to as it is written. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Mackenzie, you have the floor. The article would add one student representative that would be recommended by the school board and appointed by the town council. This student representative would not be, um, would not be one of the voting members. Anyone else would like to speak to this article? Seeing no one rushing to the mic, we will move this article as printed to the warrant. Going on to article three, this is related to the uh, stormwater infrastructure project on Pine Knoll Shores. Tom, thank you. I move the article as printed. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Tom, you got a few minutes here. Okay. I just wanted to give you folks a little bit of a summary of it. Pine Knoll Shores is on the lakes, on the shores of Babusik Lake. And uh, it's generally been uh, a much older section of town. There were a lot of camps and stuff there. We've been working for a long time to try and come up with drainage and road improvements and things of that nature to do a couple of things. One, make it so people can get back and forth to their homes in, in wet and rainy weather or during the mud season, but also to try and mitigate some of the uh, pollution effects as, as runoff goes into Babusik Lake. Um, so what happens here is we're looking uh, to receive a clean water state revolving fund loan 
of $266,338. This, because of the way the, the state waters, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund works, we have to put this in like it's a bond article. So we need to put this in and get a 60% vote but there is no impact on taxes because we're going to get completely reimbursed for the 266,000 that's needed to complete the design phase of this project. This is just the design phase. We've had plans put together for what we're going to do. We have to design specific plans for how to do it. And then we can come back once we've got those designs all figured out and come up with an actual cost and move forward with uh, costs. So this won't impact the the effort to actually solve the problem, it will just give us a solution to the problem. Um, so we're asking for the town to vote for this. Again, there's no tax impact. Uh, it's a design phase only, and it will be reimbursed by the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak to the drainage and sewer on Pine Knoll Shores? Again, seeing no one rushing to the mic, I will move this to the ballot as printed. Article 4, the operating budget. Finley, you're... I move Article 4 as printed. Thank you. Second. And Nancy, thank you. Finley, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I just want to touch on a few things on this budget. Um, this past year, as people got their tax bills a few months ago, they recognized the impacts that we've been seeing caused by a number of uh, a variety of reasons. Um, part of the reason was uh, our commercial industrial segments of it dropped in value while our residential uh, seg segment was continuing to climb, uh, which it's kind of settled down, it appears now. But that has caused, at that point, about a $75 million loss in value to the com community. Uh, that, coupled with inflationary pressures, um, uh, we've been having a a real job at it trying to uh, maintain a stable tax rate that we've sought for for years but uh, um, what I wanted to do is just touch on some of the impacts to this year's budget um, and uh, kind of point out the, the highlights of where increases have occurred in our in our proposed budget for tonight um, health insurance increases for this budget are $717,000. And when, what we get for a number of things is we have guaranteed maximum rates or, or numbers that are not to exceed numbers. Um, our uh, <clears throat> health insurance increases, uh, guaranteed maximum rate was 20.1%. Our workers' compensation went up $17,000. Uh, general liability insurance went up $14,000. Uh, we have uh, 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 Nashua Transit is we give them uh, a subsidy, I guess, uh, and that had to go up because the service was being utilized quite extensively and uh, we are reworking who can use it and how it can be used to try and help offset those costs, but that uh, showed an increase of $34,000. Uh, in solid waste, our tipping fees didn't change for recycling, but the, uh, our solid waste disposal uh, had a 6% increase by contract, as I recall, and that's uh, an $18,000 increase. Uh, electric, water, sewer, natural gas, our utilities, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, have, have increased $30,000. Our natural gas, uh, we're still under contract. We had a long-term contract that expires December of uh, 25. Uh, so that didn't change, but our electric rates went from 7.9 cents to 9.9 cents, uh, which was a good chunk of that increase. Um, our maintenance for buildings and ground has increased $16,000. Um, uh, maintenance of our equipment has increased $20,000. Our ammunition for our police department is a $32,000 increase for, for this year's budget. Let me see. Uniforms and protective clothing is, is going up $27,000. Our welfare uh, uh, and department budget has gone up $20,000. There's a few more people seeking services from uh, Pat. Uh, plowing has gone up for our town parking lots, uh, $22,000. Our union wages, including the steps for this uh, this year, uh, are increasing that line of budget, 272000 The New Hampshire retirement system is a $135,000 increase. Let's see, our firefighter overtime is $115,000. We uh, increase in the budget, and that's so that we can maintain 11 uh, 
individuals per shift. Um, and this past year, uh, I recall, as I recall, we funded it with the amount of overtime that was in the budget. If it exceeded it, um, it couldn't be exceeded. So at that point, we would drop down to 10 uh, personnel per shift. Uh, but this year, the, that is going to be funding the 11 people all the time. Uh, library gave out raises of 32, uh, an increase of $32,000. Um, for staffing, we have uh, hired a, or we're hiring a, uh, an assistant tech coordinator at $111,000. Um, we um, had a safer grant that is ex it's run out. We've used the grant that gave us four new firefighters, eight, eight new firefighters four years ago, three, four, three years ago. And uh, this is the last year of that. And so in order to uh, offset those positions, that's the increase. We had been um, trying to stable, uh, level, level that by funding capital projects uh, during each budget so that that change wouldn't be as noticeable and impactful. Uh, we have moved from part-time to full-time, a couple of positions, a custodian, uh, which is an increase in that line of $41,000. Uh, the animal control offers, we are moving to full-time, and that's a $42,000 increase. And we've um, had it uh, in the EMS part-time position with a reduction of hours for $20,000 savings. And we are changing a deputy department of public works director uh, to a civil engineer, and that's a $36,000 savings. Um, almost done. We have uh, a savings in the police vehicle line item of $15,000. Brine storage tank was purchased this past year, so it's not in the budget. That's a $25,000 off. Um, and the street sweeping and pavement marking is down $40,000, and I want to say that's because we're not using sand uh, like we used to. We're using a, a chemical in our in our mix on the roads instead, so it doesn't have to be cleaned up. And then uh, the total general fund increase is $2,117,500. And let me see, bear with me. Um, I guess I could just touch on a couple. We've, there's savings in the budget for capital projects. We installed a sprinkler system last year, so that $150,000 is not showing up in the budget. Um, the paving of the church parking lot of 92,000. And then let me see, bear with me. Um, oh, the upgrade of the fuel system has been completed, so that $1.4 million is not in this budget. And I think that's about the brunt of it. Yeah, so I think that's about it. So if you have any questions, I could try and help you out or Paul. Thank, thank you, Finley. Anyone in the audience would like to speak to the budget? For, against? Questions? You guys are making it easy on me tonight. Oh <laughs> Seeing you. none, I will move the Article 4 to the ballot as printed. We'll go on to Article 5, Capital Reserve Funds. Nancy, I think this is you. Yes, it is. I'd like to move as presented. Thank you. And Andy, you're seconding? Thank you. Nancy, have at it. Okay, I say this spiel pretty much every year, but I think it's worth repeating. To make you understand, capital reserve funds are basically our savings accounts. Every year, as you see during, in the guide here, we put money aside for various things so when the time comes to purchase, we can buy them. We recently bought a $1.5 million, it's, it's going to take like a year and a half to get it, but a ladder truck. We had the cash to do that because we were able to save up money. So in this particular year, there's $400,000 for that purpose for future purchases. We also have $700,000 for uh, infrastructure, and that's our paving. So obviously we have to keep up with that as best we can, even though we know we could do more. But again, be able to do that so we don't have to bond anything which would require interest paying. So that's what Article 5 is, is about. Anyone else want to talk about capital reserve funds tonight? Seeing none, the motion will go to the floor as you heading for the mic? OK. Um, Article 5 will go to the warrant as printed. We'll go on to Article 6, which again is capital reserve funds, just a little different. 
Madam Moderator, I'd like to move Article 6 as printed. Thank you, Andy. And Mackenzie, you're seconding? Oh, yes, I'll make a second. Thank you. Andy. So Article 6 is um, just what uh, Councillor Harrington just explained about the other savings account, except this one is specific to the um, sewer infrastructure. This one puts uh, $550,000 into that um, savings account this year. The, the one thing that's important to note about this particular article is there's no impact to the tax rate. It is paid for by sewer user fees. Um, so there's no additional tax rate impact based on this. Thank you. Anyone else want to talk about establishing a new capital reserve fund? Seeing none, we'll do the same thing. It'll move to the warrant as printed. Article 7. Uh, this is the New England Police Benevolent Association uh, salaries and benefits. This article cannot be amended. But if you'd like to talk about it, we can do that. Uh, Barb? I'd like to move the article as printed, please. Thank you. And Andy, your second. Thank you. Go ahead, Barb. Okay. So what this <coughs> article is, is it talks about the contract that has been uh, negotiated with the union. And in the short version of what this means, it's a duration of three years, starting July 1st through January, I'm sorry, through June 30th, 2027. Okay, as you look uh, in your booklet, you can see what the pay, pay scales are. Uh, it also changes the life insurance benefits. The benefit changes for employees increases from 10,000 to one times the annual salary. Spouse increased from 1,000 to 10,000 and the benefit for the children increased from 500 to 5,000. The estimated hit to the tax rate is Zero point, I'm zero six, sorry. All right. Are you waiting to speak? Come on ahead. Identify yourself, please. Diane, did you get it? Amanda McGuire. You got your voter card there? Yep. Good, thank you. Go right ahead. Good evening. Rarely do I use a public platform like this. However, tonight I feel obliged to speak in support of Article 7 from the perspective of a taxpayer and a police wife. The article proposes a salary increase and offers competitive wages for Merrimack police sergeants, detectives, and patrol officers. It prioritizes the well-being and retention of our dedicated law enforcement professionals, which is crucial when ensuring a safe community. Merrimack continue to be the gold standard of police. This was common this was a common phrase used during my childhood and remains true today. Our officers are devoted to their profession and duty, and their merit shines through their unwavering dedication and diligence. The safety and positivity that they bring to our community is second to none, and we need to honor their worth and continued sacrifices by offering competitive pay. Our officers play a vital role in maintaining the safety and security of our community. Many residents aren't aware of the rates in which our officers have left the profession, are contemplating leaving, or have already transferred to other departments. This should bring concern to every person in this room. The exodus of experienced officers not only undermines the effectiveness of our police force, but it also places significant strain on those who remain. Sometimes we have the bare minimum working a shift simply because there aren't enough people to work and what this means from a public safety standpoint. A, perfectly, a perfect example of this is right now. My husband isn't here with me tonight because right before we left, he was called in unexpectedly. Recognizing that we need to invest in competitive wages for our police is not just a matter of fairness, but also of practicality and fiscal responsibility. It may seem cost effective in the short term to maintain current wages, but the reality is the long term consequences of high turnover rates far outweigh any initial savings. Training new officers entails substantial time and financial investments for Merrimack. When a trained officer leaves, we not only lose valuable expertise, we also incur significant expenses to recruit, hire, and train their replacements. 
This cycle of turnover ultimately proves to be even more costly to our town in the long run when we consider the caliber of officers that have been leaving and the amount of training they've received, especially those with more experience. When we lose one officer, we don't just lose one officer, we lose an investment into our community. Residents need to realize how much institutional knowledge is worth and the time and cost it takes to replace it. Those in education know what it's like when we lose quality educators to surrounding districts offering better pay. That's the reality we're facing right now with our police. Competitive wages are essential for appealing to and retaining quality police officers for the future. For comparison, I inquired what other department wages were considered, and I was informed that Bedford, Londonderry, Rochester, Derry, Hudson, Keene, Nashua, Hooksett, and Goffstown were all reviewed. Each of these towns is similar in size to Merrimack, with the exception of Nashua. By offering comparable compensation packages like these towns, we demonstrate our commitment to officers' hard work and dedication in this town while ensuring that our community remains safe and well protected. When we lose officers to surrounding departments who offer more competitive pay, that is a problem, and collectively, it is our problem. The only way to fix a problem is to find a solution. Article 7 is our solution. For a $600,000 home, Article 7 comes to an annual tax of $36, or an impacted tax rate of six cents. The following year, the annual tax drops to $18, and the year after, it increases to $24. That means, for the next three years combined, we're talking about $78 total for a $600,000 house, or an overall tax rate impact of 13 cents. Wrap it up, please. Last paragraph, I promise. A small price to pay when you consider the big picture. Last but not least, I want to thank our town council for their unanimous support. I urge taxpayers to prioritize and provide our officers with the competitive pay that they deserve. Doing so demonstrates our appreciation for their service, and it serves in the best interests of our community. Failure to address this issue will not only exacerbate the challenges that we face in maintaining a strong and effective police force for years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to have words with this article? Seeing none, it will move to the ballot as printed. We'll go on to Article 8 which is another wage and benefit article and again cannot be amended. Uh, I guess Nancy? Yes, thank you Madam Moderator. Um, I'd like to move Article 8 as printed. Thank you. Second. And Tom second, thank you. All right, Nancy. Thank you. Um, article 8 pertains to the NEPBA Local 112 Collective Bargaining Agreement uh, involving our dispatchers and police office staff. Um, it is a four-year contract beginning July 1st, 2024 and ends June 30th, 2028. Uh, there are wage increases spread out over that time for dispatchers, records clerks, and our uh, police prosecutor's secretary. In year one, there are 3% raises for dispatchers, records clerks, and prosecutor's secretary, um, and an additional $1.20 adjustment. Um, and added five and 10 year steps for dispatchers, as well as a 3% three, a 3 plus a dollar adjustment for the prosecutor's secretary. In year two, there are 3% raises, um, and the dispatchers um, are to receive an additional 75 cent uh, adjustment. <coughs> year three, again, 3%, uh, with the records clerk and prosecutor's secretary uh, receiving an additional 50 cents. Um, year four, Again, 3% uh, raises, and um, then Article 11, which is relative to wages and salaries, paragraph 7, addresses shift differential, and it increases the shift differential by 25 cents an hour um, and includes the part-time dispatcher. Article 12 is relative to wages and salaries, and it increases the training stipend uh, by 50, per, uh, 50 cents an hour. Uh, the estimated tax rate impact is 0.01. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to this article? Seeing none, Article 8 will move to the ballot as printed. We'll go on to our third article with collective bargaining, number 9, which is with uh, local Teamsters. 
I and would like to move Article 9 as the article is written. Thank you, Meg. Second. Thank you. This article has to do with the Teamsters Local 633, the collective bargaining agreement with the D DP DPW uh, supervisors as well as the clerical staff of the Highway Solid Waste Equipment, Ma equipment Maintenance and Wastewater Department. Uh, this is a three three year contract uh, starting on July 1st of 2024 and it goes until June 30th of 2027. Um, in year one, the wage scale, um, it would be added 3% on top of the scale and 2.5% in between the steps. That would place each employee on the scale and move up one step. In year two, it would be a 3% wage adjustment and in year three, another 3% wage adjustment. Um, in regard to the disability insurance, um, that would change from the 60% without a cap to the 70%, um, and that would be a $700 a week cap. Um, and then there would be an additional allowance in, in regard to the clothing, um, and that would be an increase in, in the boot allowance from $200 to $300, um, and it would in, include the clerical staff skill, uh, skill operator in the boot allowance, um, and that would be an Oh, one percent on the tax rate. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak to this third wage agreement? Seeing none, it will move to the warrant as printed. We'll go on to Article 10 regarding the Community Choice Aggregation Plan. Madam Tom? Moderator, I move Article 10 as printed. Thank you. And Andy, second. you got the second. Thank you, Tom. So this is a, a different kind of thing we're trying to put forward. Uh, the Community Choice Aggregation Plan is an opportunity for us as a community to get together to purchase our electricity supply. Um, the state has enacted regulations and laws that allow the community to do th such a thing, and so we're going by the, uh, the, the rules and regulations the state's put forward. We're looking to hire a contractor to help us go out and find electric rates um, to save money, to actually get a lower rate than what the standard base rate that Eversource uh, charges us. Um, this program would be an opt-out program if the town should choose to, um, to go into the program, but we wouldn't actually contract until we can get a reasonable contract that would be lower than what Eversource is charging for your base rate. Some of the questions that come up frequently about this is whether or not you have to worry about your power going out. And the answer to that is no. Eversource would still be responsible for the delivery of your power. If you look on your power bill, you'll notice there's two different numbers that are included on that bill right now from Eversource, PS&H. There's the delivery charge, and then there's the electricity usage charge. What we're talking about here is the electricity usage charge coming from whoever we contract with, and Eversource would still be charging for delivery, and they would still be responsible for the wires on the street, uh, the wires attached to your house, uh, any lines that come down, they would still be out there picking them up and, and things of that nature and taking care of it. So you would see no change to the way you receive your electricity, uh, only hopefully a reduction in the cost of what you end up paying for your electricity. Because of the way the program is set, it requires the town to vote on this program, the Community Choice Aggregation Plan, and pass it with a majority vote before the town can even proceed to go forward. At that point, we would take our, our plan, which is available, hopefully you picked it up, and send it to the um, PUC for approval. The PUC, once they give us approval, we would then work with our contractor to go out and, and bid on electricity and, and get bids. Uh, once we are confident that we have a bid that would go from anywhere from six months to a couple of years, depending upon what's available out there, that would actually give us a better rate than what PSNH is offering, then we would um, move forward to go into that contract. To do that, we would have to contact the community through cards or letters asking you if you want to opt out of the program uh, that we're preparing to move into. This will be open to anybody in the residential and business community that are on the default service from PSNH right now. If you're already buying your electric service from a third-party vendor like I happen to be right now, 
then you would have to opt in you would have to ask to be added into the program which i intend to do um, because it takes it away from me having to worry about the changes every six months or whatever it is and make sure that i'm getting the right rate and puts it into an organization's hands to try and get me a better rate uh, you can always opt out you can opt back in but you have to do it on your monthly billing cycle so you can opt out and back in again every month if you want to but uh, so if you don't think you're getting the right rate or you want to go out and find your own rate uh, you're welcome to do that um, it's but it is an opt out program you have to if the town votes to go with this program you will be enrolled in it if you're an, a default customer and then you will be given a chance to opt out there'll be a website there will be all kinds of opportunities for us um, but we think it, it's an opportunity to save money. The town municipality already buys third-party electric uh, through the vendor that we're talking about using. And so this is not a new thing for the staff uh, to understand how it's operating. There's no cost to the tax rate. There's no cost uh, to the municipality to do this. There's a very, very small fee that's associated with the rate that we would get that pays for our contractor. Uh, it's a, like a thousandth of a cent or something like that per kilowatt hour. So, you know, we would definitely make sure that the rate we're contracting uh, gives us every chance to have a lower rate over an extended period of time and hopefully keeps the rate as level as possible without the spikes and the jumps up and down that we've been experiencing with the current service. Thank you, Tom. Andy, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Just a couple points I'd like to add. <clears throat> One, the town already does this. The town goes out and purchases our utilities in bulk and they realize the savings by doing that. All we're doing with this program is duplicating what the town already does. Um, secondly, it's important to know all we're doing is changing the default provider. Currently, if you move into town and if you do nothing, you are automatically assigned up for Eversource as your provider. All we're doing is changing that default to our community aggregation um, choice. And we're only going to do that if we can beat Eversource's rate. Um, otherwise, we will leave Eversource as, as the supplier until we can beat their rate on the marketplace. And then lastly, if you're with a third party supplier, we're not going to move you into this program and you are more than welcome to stay with that third party supplier for as long as you want. And then as Tom mentioned, if you realize 60, 90 days later that this program is actually getting a better rate than your third party supplier, you're, all you gotta do is opt in and you can jump right into the program. Six months into the program, you realize there's a third party supplier out there that's beating the community choice rate. All you got to do is opt out and go to the third party supplier. So there's the sole focus of this program is to combine our buying power and get a better rate for, for the residents of Merrimack. Thank you, Andy. Thanks. Wendy, are you waiting? Yeah. Uh, for the record, for the record, I'm Wendy Thomas of Wildcat Falls Road, um, Merrimack, and I'm one of the state reps for the town. I sit on the Science, Technology, and Energy Committee where we hear all of the state's energy bills. I'm also a member of the Community Power Aggregation Subcommittee in town that has been working to get this program in place in Merrimack. <coughs> Community Power Aggregation is a system where local governments aggregate or combine the purchasing power of individual electricity customers within a defined jurisdiction to secure alternative energy supply contracts. Basically, it's a way to combine our buying power to purchase energy at a lower cost. Community, community power aggregation provides numerous benefits to its communities, including cost savings, greater control over energy choices, support for renewable energy, economic development, consumer empowerment, promotion of energy efficiency and stimulation of competition and innovation in the energy sector. You will, as, they've, as has been pointed out, you will have the option of joining or not joining the program, and you will always have the opportunity to leave the program if you so choose. This is a win-win-win program for our town. 
It's a good program that will result in lower energy costs for everyone. I fully support this warrant article, and I urge you to vote in support of it. Thank, Thank you, you, Wendy. Go right ahead. Madam Moderator. Uh, Madam Moderator, my name is John Sauter. I live on Elizabeth Drive in Merrimack. Uh, looking at the plan before I heard what Tom said, I saw this. <laughs> Services provided to the program by the consultant will be funded by adding a consultancy fee agreed to by the governing body to the prices charged by the program suppliers. Now, Tom has mentioned that that fee will be very small, but I don't see anything in the plan that guarantees that. And I don't know it really how we could guarantee it. So what I ask instead is that there be an annual report of all the money that goes in and all the money that goes out, including the money that goes to the consultant. Uh, so that we can see whether the consulting fee has grown to the point where it swallows almost all the savings. Uh, I would also like that report to show how much those who have opted into the plan saved compared to those who have not opted in. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Tom, you want to address that? Um, there's not a lot I can address to that. We, we will obviously do the best we can to keep up with all that information. Um, we've been able to re uh, receive some of the information from our contractor that uh, shows how much has been saved by other communities. Uh, your actual bill goes to PSNH. It doesn't go to us or to the contractor. So you pay your electric bill to PSNH the way you always have, but when you see your bill, you will see a, a charge for the electric subsidy, the electric supply, as well as the delivery. And the electric supply, instead of saying PSNH, will now say whatever the community choice aggregation contract says. And the, um, you'll be able to easily see what PSNH charges, because they put that on their website, and what you're being charged on a kilowatt hour basis. So you'll always be able to see how much you're being charged. Right now, we don't have a contract with our supplier. We just have the individual that we've been working with but they have told us the number that they have, and there's no reason to believe that that number would be increasing. But we would certainly make that well known on our website, uh, and we will have links on our website to all the information about how to get in, how to get out, um, and, and what those charges are. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, um, in addition, the uh, consultant who we use will have a community choice aggregation website where you'll be able to see the information of whatever sources rates are at the time versus what we're, if we go with this program, what our rates would be. In addition, uh, the reason why it's not in the plan, the percent of one one thousandth of a cent, is because that is a separate contract that the town council would enter into with the person who's gonna be helping us in this forte. There are a couple different companies that, are, that can provide us the services that we need to help us go out to bid, maintain our websites and things of that sort. That's why it's not in the plan, but it will be in a contract that the town council will see and they will vote on. Thank you, Paul. Lon? Lon Woods, 2 Arbor Street, Merrimack. I just have a couple of questions and I beg the body's patience uh, in reading the benefits of community aggregation. One statement says, public oversight, electricity supplier, and consultant acceptable to, uh, accountable to town officials. What does that mean? Tom? I, I think that the best way to describe that is that we will be in constant working relationship with the, uh, the folks that we're dealing with so that our supplier and the consultant will be working with us for that contract and we'll be in constant contact with them to be able to understand what's going on and, and uh, keeping things. It would be the aggregation committee or the council? Yes, that's not exactly figured out yet at this point, but it will be either a, a new aggregation committee or it will be the town council through the town manager's office. I just want to know who to gripe to. <laughs> um, you mentioned that a program administration outsourced consultant would be a very, very small fee. What is a very, very small fee? 
I believe it's a, uh, right now we're understanding it to be about a thousandth of a cent per, um, or excuse me, not a thousandth of a cent, uh, um, 0.001 cents per kilowatt hour. And so we're currently comes, being charged eight and a half or nine or something like that. I think Eversource dropped their number down. Uh, they were up at 18 at one point, so we're talking about 0.01 cents per kilowatt hour. And that comes with that the comes in as part of your bill. It's not bill. a separate charge, and it's not a charge to the town. It'll be part of the bill. Thank you, Lon. Thank you. Next. Hi, Mary Beth Raven, 9 Four Winds Road, Merrimack. First, I would like to commend our town manager, Paul, uh, because last fall, several of us in the community uh, came to Paul and said, hey, we've been hearing about this thing called community power. It's happening in some of the other towns. Have you heard of it? He was already on top of it. He already had a vendor. We, we were able to uh, make this happen. We, not myself personally, I didn't have to because Paul was already on top of it and a committee was formed. And I want to let everybody else know, 30 other towns in New Hampshire have already done this including Concord, who uh, they, they don't have a, a the, the, we don't, they don't have to vote the way we have to vote, but their town council last night voted unanimously to go with the community power program. Um, most of the things in these warrant articles are saying 16 cents here, it's gonna cost you, and 84 cents there. This one is probably gonna save us all money, so I think it's a no-brainer, and thank you very much for being on top of it and looking into it for us. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to talk about this? Seeing none, Article 10 will go to the warrant as printed. We have two articles left, both petitioned, but before we go to that, I want to go back to the town council and give Paul a chance to introduce his department heads who I have seen wander in here this evening. That's it. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. If my uh, department heads and division heads could please stand up so everybody can see you. We'll introduce you to them. All right, as I, as I call out your name, please raise your hand. Pat Murphy is Welfare Coordinator. Sharon Marunich is HR Director. Leo Gaudet is Wastewater Treatment. Don Talamala is DPW Director. Lori Halverson is the Highway Garage Operations Manager. Chris Peralt is over at the transfer station. Chief Mark DeFranzo, I think everybody knows, is the fire chief. Robert Price is my community development director. Yvette Kowser is a head librarian. She's in charge of the library. I have Matt Kasparius, who is the parks and rec coordinator. Next to him is Jonathan Diaz, who's the IT coordinator. In the back, I have Chief Brian Levesque. I have a new department head that is gonna start in a week or so. He's my new finance director, Paul Calabria. And we would be remiss without the services of Nickel Valley and the media service and his team. I wanna give a special shout out to Justin. <laughs> and Grace back at the studio. Without these three people in media services, you would not be able to see all the meetings that you see, all the sporting events that they cover. There's just three of them that cover all the meetings and all the sporting events. They do an, a great job. They get it out on the websites for you. Nick is also in charge of our Facebook pages throughout town, so he makes sure that everybody knows what's going on in Merrimack. So I want a special thanks to those group because without them, the information we would not see through meetings or everything else that goes on. So thank you very much. I, I want to take a little bit of executive privilege here. He mentioned Matt Kasparius as the Parks and Rec Director. Matt has spent an enormous amount of time putting together just a wealth of options for you to do on Parks and Rec, from going to a trip to Ireland or Iceland, to going to movies, to having band concerts. He's got a display out here in the lobby as you come in or go out. Please take a look at what's there and what your options are, and take advantage of it. There's some wonderful things out there. Thank you, Matt. And there, there is one more person that uh, the town council would like to recognize, and that's Becky Thompson. She keeps us in check and makes sure all our meetings are properly posted. Thank you, Becky. 
Becky always has my back, too. All right, we're going to go to the petition articles. The first one is to, uh, relative to the um, development of town-owned land for athletic fields. Hi, John Calabro, 16 Hutchinson Road, and I propose that the article move forward as written. Thank you, John. Go ahead. We have a second. Thank you. John, you're going to speak to this? Well, you, you, you proposed it. Yeah, so we have a short PowerPoint uh, presentation to show, and I will uh, speak to that. should be fairly quick. Uh, so I'm John Calabro, I'm president of the MYA, representing all of the uh, volunteers and folks that run all the sports programs in the town for our kids. Uh, to my right is Rick Grenier, vice president, and the rest of the EB behind me. Uh, we have brought this article forward in terms of uh, looking for some new field space for our town. I assume most of you uh, know what MYA is in this town. Uh, we're an all-volunteer organization that provides the sports programs for all of the children in Merrimack. Um, the, uh, the organization's been in place since 1968, um, 55 years of uh, volunteerism. Next slide, please. So uh, this is just a, a quick uh, view of the article as written, and we understand. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the funding method uh, that we're looking for is to uh, raise funds uh, to develop this land into a field. Uh, it, I was told it comes to 22 cents per thousand. Looking in the packet, it's 20 cents per thousand. So uh, we got a little bit of a bargain going on. So that's good. Um, so an example on a $500,000 home, uh, you know, about $100 there. Um, the town council understands and supports the town's needs for fields, but just hasn't quite been able to include the funding in the budget. Uh, it's been talked about every year, and of course, as you can imagine, it's a pre pretty easy uh, line item to, uh, to strike, and that's what's been happening over the years, uh, and uh, this is why we're here. Next slide, please. Uh, this is some uh, pictorials of the land. The land is on Pearson Road, about a mile up the road from the Reeds Ferry School. Um, it's a parcel of land that was donated to the town as part of Greenfield Subdivision. Um, we feel that uh, the respectful thing to do would be to utilize this, field, this space. Uh, as you all know, land is extremely valuable in Merrimack and all surrounding towns, certainly New England. Um, you know, and, and perhaps by using this field space for this purpose, for the purpose of, of kids and activity and outdoor uh, space, it might encourage other landowners in this town to donate some space, which would obviously help uh, keep the, the uh, Merrimack um, uh, fields going and kind of keep our suburban community feel versus more and more apartments, as of course you've all seen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a picture of the drawing uh, we received from the town engineer, uh, basic layout of the space. It, can, it affords uh, a full-size soccer, football, lacrosse field, uh, a softball field, which could also be used for baseball, and adequate off-street parking, uh, which is uh, one of our concerns. Um, next slide, please. This is just a, a, a close-up of that drawing. You can see the soccer field, uh, which is actually a little bigger than a football field, so it works for that. And the, uh, and the softball field uh, with about 70 spaces of parking 
the good news is the land is very flat, which makes development of it uh, a lot easier. You know, we're not going to hit the granite state in this parcel of land, which is a good thing. And uh, that's kind of what it looks like. Next slide, please. Uh, so back in 2010, there was a, a study commissioned by the town council at the time to look at the athletic fields and the needs of the community. Uh, in a nutshell, that report, a uh, very thorough report done uh, long before my time, of course, um, showed the need for about 21 new fields in this town, with five of them being immediate. This is back in 2010. Uh, the recommendation was to uh, uh, set aside money each year to fund these fields as we go forward, or to jump up to one 15-year bond for about $2 million to get it all started. Uh, to date, neither of these recommendations have been enacted, uh, which is why we kind of are, we, we are where we are at this point in time. Uh, and there's a link to that, um, that study. Uh, if you want to read it page for page, uh, have some time because it shows a lot of great information there, but it's long. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what are some of our concerns for this field? Okay, first and foremost, uh, we have a risk of loss. Merrimack uh, MYA programs use the fields donated to the town uh, from Colesman, or now called Elbit, and Gatinge, which I think was the old Cabletron back in the day, uh, for soccer, softball, and baseball. Uh, as you can imagine, land is getting much more valuable. Uh, the Colesman fields are right off of exit 10. Uh, it, it seems to me that... Uh, uh, the risk of those, of those companies either developing that land or selling that land off is, is getting higher and higher. And if we lose those fields, that would put us in a terrible situation, almost to the point where we, we might have to scale back or even eliminate uh, teams and programs. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the other concern really is safety of our children. These donated fields over the years are getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, the companies are donating the land, but they're not too interested in investing in the land. Uh, the town, which, you know, the DPW department does an excellent job helping us keep these fields usable. But, of course, uh, you know, spending big money into these fields when you could uh, have a risk of losing those fields is not very economical or, fees or a, a smart investment at this point. What does it do for children? They're playing on... Uh, ruts, they're playing on rocks, they're playing in mud, uh, uh, sets them up for more injury, and uh, you know, MYA, we don't want any of our children to get injured when they're playing. Um, parking safety, uh, if uh, all of you that have children that have gone to these games, the, the restriction in field space makes it so that we have to schedule games back to back to back. So you can imagine that the first group comes in, parks their cars, the second group comes in before the first group leaves. So the parking tends to extend out into the streets. And, and then when that first game is over, you have an empty parking lot and a bunch of cars out in the street. Uh, the parking is not very organized at some of these fields, which leads to people parking here and there and everywhere. And of course, anyone who's been to the game, uh, the siblings come, the young kids come, they're running around, and there's serious risk of uh, uh, someone getting hit by a car, which, you know, would be terrible. Uh, so those are some of our main concerns. Uh, you know, the other, the other thing, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really a part of the kids having pride in their town, having pride of where they're playing. Uh, uh, sports is a big part of how we show ourselves to the surrounding communities. Uh, our children are kind of hearing comments like, oh, this field stinks, why do you play here? And that negatively affects them. The idea is to create Merrimack pride in these kids. Uh, they're proud of their schools. They're proud of their sports. Um, you know, they take it very seriously. You know, as adults, we tend to think, oh, it's no big deal. But to these young kids, it's an impressionable thing. Uh, so we want to help them. We want to help them keep our reputation as a great place to be a great place to live, a great place to raise a family, and have our children be, who is clearly the next generation in this town, to be able to stay with pride and come back. Um, so that's kind of the, the things we want to show. The rest of the slides are really some frequently asked questions that we've seen on our website that we've tried to answer, uh, and that's um, 
that's listed on our website. Oh, one last thing I forgot, so go back to that slide. So there was a study done in 2020 around growth of this town. And of course, we've all seen the apartment complexes come up, the number of houses coming up. From 2020, the estimate was 274 to 337 additional children. Uh, pretty exact numbers, I'm not sure how they came up with that. But uh, if half of those kids play MYA sports, we will be absolutely restricted with field space and we would have to limit our availability almost to the point of cutting off registration, which we, we work really hard not to do that. If a child wants to play a sport in Merrimack, we want to support that as best we can. Um, so the problem may get worse going forward, and uh, as you can see, probably has gotten worse. Our numbers are, in fact, coming up, and uh, the field space restriction is, is, is having more and more effect on it. Uh, so thank you for listening. Thank and you. All set? Yeah, thank you. We'll give them a minute to get back into their seats quietly. And yes, go ahead. My name is Ashley Coleman. I live at Ten Vanden Road in Merrimack, and I have been a part of the MYA Lacrosse Board for about six years since 2018. So I actually take this very, very personally at this point. Um, so I will tell you a little bit of backstory about me. So my husband's from Merrimack, and I remember when we started to move to Merrimack, he's like, "Well, let's move to Merrimack," and he's like, "Well, probably not much has changed in the past 20 years," and it kind of looks like that's pretty much the case. Um, so. What I did is when we came to this town, I decided to kind of try and change that from within. So I decided as a member of this community that I really wanted to be as impactful as I possibly can. So what I did is I started to create, um, or I took over the um, instructional program at the Merrimack Youth Lacrosse, and I started that in 2018, I took that over. When I took it over, it only had 12 people that actually came. The last time I had my um, fiddlestick sessions, which was in the fall, which we're going to be doing it again in the spring, we do it twice a year, we are up to 60 plus children for this entire program. Not only that, lacrosse in the um, state and the town of Merrimack has grown exponentially over the past six to eight years since I've been on this board. And I know, I know I've seen, I have a couple other board members with me, I know they're here and they're going to attest to this as well. Um, we as a community need to grow these types of programs and you know, like the gentleman said, we don't have adequate fields to able to allow these programs to grow properly. You know, and having a sense of pride in your community is really, really important. One thing I will say is, you know, lacrosse is actually in this town of Merrimack celebrating its 25th year this year, which again, my husband grew up here. He was a part of the third season of lacrosse, and back then, it was mediocre at best. But Last year, our high school varsity team placed fourth out of, in Division I, which really is the best they can possibly do given the talent that they are up against. So in, the, in 20 years, we have been able to grow this community, to grow the sport, to grow something in this community where people can be prideful of. I had one kid say to me, he's like, hey, I guess lacrosse is really growing in Merrimack. I heard it's really popular. This is what we want to hear in a community. We want a sense of pride. We want people to be proud that they're from this community. But here's the thing. I have personally witnessed two of my players blow their knee out on the fields. Because we have four fields that lacrosse is able to um, accommodate for because Colesman and Elbit are not available for lacrosse. They are not allowed. They are like, yep, it's only for soccer. And that's perfectly understandable. But in the time that I've been on the lacrosse board, this program in itself, and again, I can only attest for lacrosse because that's all I know, but this program has exponentially grown. And again, that is from the efforts of the board that I have been a part of. Every single member has dedicated time, hours, stress. The reason why half of them aren't here is because they are at practice right now. So Wrap it I up, please. I am here just to kind of advocate for that. And I just want to say that having even just one more field will just do so much it will give so much benefit to the people of this town, to the children of this town, because we are trying to develop and grow this town into something better than it was. Thank you. Thank you.
Madam Moderator, my name is John Sauter. I live on Elizabeth Drive in Merrimack. I move to amend the article by changing $1 million to $10,000 and changing development to studying the development. Development to what? Studying the development. Studying development. OK, thank you very much. George, do you have it written? Uh, I have it written on this piece of paper here, if that'll help any. If you could write it for me, please. I will. All right, where, do we have a second? Name, please. Thank you. All right, go ahead. We're going to talk about amending the amount down to 10,000, is that correct? Yes. And to study development as yes. opposed to actually develop? Yes. Okay, go ahead and speak to the amendment, please. My concern, Madam uh, uh, Moderator, is that uh, I don't know where that million dollars came from. I don't know how well justified it is. I would like to see a study uh, which would give us a real number based on an actual plan to perform this. The, th the, the thing that causes me the greatest concern is that I walked on this land a couple of weeks ago and discovered that it is all wetlands, every bit of it, the whole 10 acres. If we're going to destroy some wetlands, we have to create new wetlands somewhere else to make up for that. And I don't know where in town we'd be able to do that. And a plan would uh, show us the answer to that question. Thank you. We're going to talk about the change from develop to study and from a million down to 10,000. Anybody want to talk about that amendment? Max, you heading for the, okay. Go ahead. Uh, Max Abramson, 15 Jostin Drive. Uh, uh, actually more of a um, uh, question on this, uh, on this article. It says, recommended by the town council two to five to zero um, on the original petition. Is that only two voted in favor and then five against? That's correct. Okay, so it isn't actually recommended, it's not recommended? Correct. Um, and then my, I guess my other question would be, um, and I, I guess that's open to anyone, is, is $10,000 an appropriate amount of money to be spent on a study? Um, is this something that could be accomplished through uh, just uh, private citizens or through the elected officials going out and, and investigating this at a, at a public hearing and uh, bringing the, uh, the stakeholders back in to go ahead and do this? Okay. Uh, the, the point that I wanted to make, though, on this is um, I'm not sure that I would, I would vote for the amendment, and, and my reason is that it would take away the ability of the voters to decide the issue itself. I understand what the, uh, the mover is, is promoting, that he wants additional information before he votes on it, um, but I, I believe that the issue is ready to go forward to the voters. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to speak to the amendment? Katie Schwartz, 9 Maidstone Drive. $10,000 would be woefully insufficient for what we need to develop that land, and the money that was suggested for how much we needed was from the engineering plans drawn up by the town, and once the money is received, as I understood it, that then it would go out to bid, so we would be involved in that process. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Craig Francoeur, 11 Pilgrim Ave. Uh, one of uh, the things that he brought up is that he was currently on the property and he said that it was all wetlands. We've had one of the wettest winters that we've ever had, so just because ground is wet does not classify it as wetlands. Thank you. Laurie? Laurie Rothhouse, 14 Kittredge Lane. I want to speak against the motion. 54 years ago, my father, with six other couples, founded the MYA. The reason they founded the MYA is to give children in this town an opportunity to gain leadership, to gain skills. This is a petition war and article that comes from the hearts of the MYA. It needs to go to the voters in that form. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. We got Uh, 
Uh, again, John Calabro, MYA president. Uh, just a retort on the gentleman before me. Um, the, the, the drawing was made by our town manager who is a professional engineer. Uh, the estimates that of the million dollars uh, was back in 2022. There was an estimate made of around 800 and something K. Uh, the update from um, uh, the town engineer brought it up to about 975,000. Uh, we feel that these numbers are quite accurate and uh, this field could be developed for that amount of money or less. Thank you. All right. We are going to vote on the amendment. Do you want to change this petitioned article to say $10,000 instead of uh, a million and to also change it to study the development, not to develop the fields? So that's what you're voting on. Do you want to change this? All those in favor of changing this article, raise your cards. You don't have a lot of support here, guys. Thank you. All those opposed to amending it? Uh, I don't think I even need to count. The amendment fails. Is there anyone else that wants to speak to the original? I'm moderating. Go ahead, Tom. Okay. Um, I just want to point out there was asked why the town council hadn't uh, fully supported this. Um, we're talking about a million dollars and 20 cents additional on the tax rate. Uh, we didn't believe that at this time it was appropriate, uh, those of us that voted against it, to, um, to ask for that kind of money for athletic fields. I re realize and I have a lot of respect for the MYA and the programs that they're pre presenting. And we've been trying and trying to figure out ways to be able to fund it. But uh, as a town council or as a member of the town council, I didn't believe that a million dollars was an appropriate number to ask for the voters to up at one time. Um, whether we do it through capital reserve funds, whether we do it over a bond or something like that. Um, I also felt like we needed more solid information on the cost and, and expense and whatnot. The plans that were drawn up were drawn up by an engineer, but they weren't fully developed and designed plans, to my knowledge. Um, so that's why I haven't been in support of uh, asking the town to, to fund a million dollars at this time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Rosemary? No, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Katie Schwartz, Nine Maidstone. Hi, everyone. I'm sure some of you have enjoyed numerous emails from me as the MYA soccer director here in Merrimack. I've been a soccer coach with MYA for the last six years, coaching both travel and rec teams. Soccer has enrolled more than 600 players for the last four seasons that we've been operating. For the past two years, I've been directly involved in scheduling practices and games for MYA soccer. The limitations of field availability that this proposal seeks to address have made it increasingly more difficult. I've been involved in the engagement with InBev to regain use of Anheuser-Busch fields with disappointing results. I've worked with Parks and Rec, the Executive Board, and other sport board directors to minimize conflicts and find solutions to the field issues we currently face. Merrimack lacks the field space needed for the volume of players in youth sports. At this time, this is our best step forward. My husband coaches flag football, baseball, and basketball with MYA as well, so if the fields are open, our family is most likely at one of them. Like many parents, I have walked along busy Amherst Road with children to get to games at Twardowski. Similarly, congestion at Reeds, Elbit, Veterans, and Gibson have increased each year. I have personally heard from many parents regarding this issue and hope that this project will remedy some of the concerns. I have independently researched grant and funding options to gauge what impact those avenues would have on the, this or future projects. I've researched the benefits on youth, of youth sports on children and the benefits of community investment in youth sports on the entire community. I've read through the 2010 field study and am disheartened that after the recommendation, nothing has come from it. I share fellow taxpayers' concerns and empathize with the need for wise budgeting and limiting tax increases. A five-year bond option ended up as an increased tax to the entire community, which is why this option was selected. I hope this one-time expense will be given serious consideration tonight and in April. Thank, Thank you. you. Rosemary. Hi, Rosemary Rung, 21 Ministerial Drive. I have a few questions. One, um, if this article is improved, 
Does the money go into the athletic field capital reserve fund, which I believe is non-lapsing, no. or just goes into? General budget. General budget. Does it compel the town council to use this money for the development of those fields, or can they elect not to move forward? They, they can use the money for the fields only. They cannot use it for any other purpose. Okay, then do they have to spend the money if this no. passes? Okay. And um, the other question I have, and, and I, I want to preface my remarks by saying I have tremendous respect and support for the MYA. My three children went through multiple programs. We've coached. I volunteered. It is really a shining star of, of our community. And the more we can support it and build on it, I think we'll just make Merrimack a better place to live and raise a family. Um, one of the kind of red flags that came up to me in reading this, though, is the issue around wetlands. I happen to serve on the House Resources Recreation Development Committee, and that can be a, uh, a really sticky wick um, in making the decision and understanding and the engineering to do with dredge and fill wetlands. So I would like to recommend the organizers, if this passes, to get DES engaged early on. I'm sure they would be happy to come down and evaluate it and give some kind of back of the envelope estimate for what would be involved in that part of the project. Thank, Thank you, Rosemary. You. Finley? Thank you, Madam Moderator. I just wanted, uh, I was one who voted uh, to recommend this article, and the reason I wanted to explain why, because I am normally hesitant to do so unless it's in our plan as a council uh, working with our CAP and so on. Um, in a couple of years, we are, there is, there are, it's in the CIP uh, to start doing field work. The reason I supported it when uh, uh, John had come to the council meeting to make his presentation is because that report, I remember when that was done, and it was recognized that it was all very much a reality, and it's just in balancing budgets and dealing with tax rates and everything, it was kind of neglected in my estimation. At least I've neglected it. and. Uh, so um, it, because it was coming up in the very near future, I did go along with the support of this Warren article uh, for the reasons that had been suggested uh, by John and, um, and the potential loss of fields and so on. Thank you, Finley. Chuck? Chuck Moore, 4 Depot Street. I was born here in Merrimack. I've seen a lot of changes. I've seen a lot of things that we couldn't afford. Couldn't afford a doctor in town at one point. And today I don't know that we're any better off on the whole because I've been participating my whole life in the citizen's responsibility of being a member of this community. There's lots of things that I would like to see. I have a minority voice, however, and the things that I would like to see haven't necessarily been appealing to the majority, um, much less leadership in the community. There's lots of things we need and this is not a triage. It's time we figured out what our problem is with the property tax and the funding of our schools and the funding of our community. Otherwise, we will always be hamstrung and we will never amount to much of anything when we see so many communities around us prospering. And we scratch our heads and say, why not Merrimack? Why, why don't we have more? Um, I don't think it's necessary to enumerate what we need. Lots of people see it. Here's a chance for a hardworking group in the town who's built something in the town and participated in the town. Some of my kids played in the MYA. I say it's time to start somewhere with making some improvements that the majority of people might like to see. And to that extent, I would be glad to raise my voice and add it to the MYA. 
We need to improve this town, and we need to be a participant in the 21st century. Let us start here. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> oh, he's just looking for sympathy. Yeah. Right. Uh, Greg I Miller. can say that I had one of those. <laughs> Uh, Greg Miller, uh, One Harrington Drive uh, here in Merrimack, uh, also the president of the Merrimack Cardinals, uh, football and cheerleading um, group of uh, kids here in the town. Uh, just, you know, keep it brief. I know there's a lot of people talking, but to throw uh, mine and our support behind it uh, and kind of address some of the, the issues that everyone is seeing, um, sometimes the, the value or the money, uh, $100 ish, uh, depending on your household, uh, gets people. How many people in town haven't given 20, 25, 30 dollars, whatever it is, 50 dollars to the kid that walks up in their uniform asking for some donations? Um, now you put that across all the sports that it's going to help, not only football, cheerleading, lacrosse, soccer, but so uh, softball. Every child in town, um, imagine them walking up to your door and just asking for some help. Um, it's super important. Um, just from the football and cheerleading standpoint, if you've ever been to a Sunday at Veterans uh, Memorial, um, you know, the, the DPWs does a great job, Parks and Rec does a great job trying to keep up with it, um, but we have one of the worst fields in our program. We can't host championship games here in Merrimack because of our field conditions. Um, it's, they just don't allow it. Um, so now we're going to other fields uh, in town, uh, Amherst, um, Bedford, Manchester, that can host it even if we are in the championship game, um, which I quite frankly think is a little bit embarrassing for us as a town. Um, it was brought up earlier about a study. The study was done. It was done 14 years ago. We need more fields in, in the town. Um, we're kind of a laughing stock when it comes to youth sports, uh, at least in, in my genre where, where I go to the meetings. So uh, please support this. Um, again, we do a lot of things, um, you know, whether it's adding a, a, a bunch of millions of dollars to a building that's going to help 26 people or whatever the number is. This is going to help thousands of kids. Please uh, put your vote behind it. Thank you. Thank you. One more. Uh, Allison Fee, 5 Rocky Ledge Road. Um, just a bit of frustration. This, we've, kicked this to the can, we've kicked this can down the road since 2010. We've done the studies. We know that sports are increasing. We know participating is in, is participation is increasing. We know that if we kick it further down the road, it's going to cost more and more money. It's going to be less likely that we, as a town, will support it. So why delay it? Just let's get it done now for the community, for the parents, for the families that support the town. So I say that up front because just listening to everybody talk, it's, it just gets a little frustrating, right? I have, I'm a parent um, of twin boys, age 10. They've been involved in sports since they were about five. So as soon as they met the age um, cutoff, they've played. It has brought to them and our family a sense of community, new friends, have helped them develop socially, mentally, and physically, as it has for all families who have kids or grandkids who participated and continue to participate. As new families have moved to the town, it would be an amazing thing for all of them to have the same opportunity. As John mentioned in the presentation, if we do not uh, add fields, the likelihood of that will diminish, absolutely diminish. Some of the fields used now, as everybody has mentioned, are kindly donated by corporations in the town, we are beholden to their generosity and which at any, uh, in any number of factors, they can decide to revoke their generosity. Scheduling field time for existing teams is challenging at best, as Katie mentioned, as, as others have mentioned, not to mention that some of the existing fields are in disrepair without proper drainage or lighting. So imagine with the Merrimack developments that more kids want to play and participate rates continue to increase. We don't have the space to support them. As it is, sports programs have to rent out space from other towns just to get field, just to get on the field. There's a one-time impact. It's $110 for a $500,000 house, 22 cents per thousand. The parcel of land was set aside already. That is half the battle, given the lack of any other space to put fields. We see, again, we seem to want to keep kicking the can down the road on this one, and it's not getting any less expensive compared to 2010. At some point, we need to take a stand that sports are an important part and help represent the health of our town, our community. Um, to me, this one's a no-brainer. Pat, I'm going to interrupt just a minute. I'm starting to hear repetitive comments and testimony. If you've got something new, 
Please go ahead. Uh, two of the speakers mentioned the Capital Reserve Fund. And you're going to identify yeah, yourself you. first, right. right? Pat Heinrich. Thank you. Edgewood Ave. Uh, two of the prior speakers mentioned, Tom One and Rosemary Rung mentioned, there's a Capital Reserve Fund for athletic fields, and I'm wondering how much is in it. And several of the speakers have talked about the condition of our fields, and I'm wondering why we're not using that Capital Reserve Fund that we're saving money for every year to maintain or improve those fields. And yes, just like everything else, we talk about it and talk about it and kick it down the road and kick it down the road. And athletic fields is one of those things that's also been kicked down the road for a lot of years. Um, we need to do this. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Wait, just a minute. We've got to get a couple of answers here. 167. Okay. Paul, you know how much is in the capital reserve? Yep, uh, $167,000. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Hi, Matt Morn, uh, Wildcat Falls Road in Merrimack. Um, I am also part of the softball board. Uh, I have a 10-year-old daughter, and uh, she's been playing softball going on four years now. Um, past couple of years, it's, you know, she's really gotten into it. She's gotten pretty good. And, uh, you know, she wants to practice on her own. <laughs> And we can't find a spot to practice, you know? It, it's just not available in town. We go three, four fields. Everyone's full. When I was a kid, I could always find a field, right? It cut me out of trouble. It didn't matter if it was with a team, pick up, whatever it was. We don't have that here. And that's a real shame. You know, we live, uh, in a post-COVID era where kids are struggling socially with development, with confidence, they're stuck on screens, they don't have the opportunity to get on a field. Help our kids. Thank you. Thanks. At this point, I'm going to call a question, and this article 11 will move to the ballot as printed. Article 12, again by petition, <coughs> related to the uh, police enforcement. Max? Uh, looks like somebody left their voting card. And I'll just... no, I guess you get to vote twice. No, <laughs> She's no. joking. She's joking. <laughs> Mama didn't raise no Democrat. <laughs> well, that, that's, 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 a, that's an old joke Max. from back getting in the low. days. That's before your time. Uh, Max Abramson, uh, 15 Jawson Drive. Um, do you want me to read the uh, citizen's petition to move if, it? If you are going to make it as it's printed, you can just say move it as printed. All right, move as printed. Thank you. Do we have a second? Who's second? Name? Thank you. Go ahead, Max. Thank you. What we're trying to do with this petition is to stop Merrimack from being turned into a sanctuary city uh, by current and future town councils and other officials. Uh, career criminals, Russian and Ukrainian mafia, Latin American drug cartels, and even terrorist groups have been able to sneak into this country to commit crimes and many international human trafficking operations have used our poorest borders, both with Canada and Mexico, to kidnap, rape, and kill Americans. Um, there's a book, oh my gosh, is that a stink bug? It smells like it. There's a, a book out on the 20th hijacker where they asked, uh, there were actually 20 hijackers in the September 11th attack, and one of the federal officials who was interviewing uh, one of the hijackers uh, developed a suspicion and decided that he wasn't going to rubber stamp and send this individual along. So one of the planes was shorthanded by one terrorist. Um, and I just read in, uh, on the news that uh, one of the serial killers from El Salvador was just uh, hit with four life sentences for four brutal murders. The way that he was caught is they, the police in Nevada were um, investigating him for being here in the country illegally. And uh, also he had uh, 
a number of other minor crimes that they, and uh, warrants that they were looking for him on. And it was only because they happened to do their, their due dil diligence that they were able to uh, find this guy and put him away. Um, USCIS Citizen and Immigration Service describes a sanctuary city as a jurisdiction that prevents its police from cooperating with federal immigration enforcement authorities and provides protection to immigrants who are in the country without legal permission. These cities often char characterized by the refusal to hand over undocumented immigrants to U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, uh, even if immigration is wanted, even if the illegal immigrant is wanted by ICE. That's from their website. In the state legislature, when I led the floor debate on House Bill 262 to stop any towns from becoming sanctuary cities, officers contacted us during the hearing and before and said that they were being told not to enforce basic immigration laws, nor even comply with immigration detainer requests from ICE. Some officers were not even allowed to email uh, the federal government to find out if the person that they'd stopped or were questioning had a dangerous history. We've been assured emphatically that there's, quote, no remote chance of Merrimack becoming a sanctuary city, unquote. And yet, uh, Cher uh, Cheshire County, Derry, Manchester, and three other towns woke up after public meetings just like this one to find out that they'd been turned into sanctuary cities without the general public ever being asked. And that's the purpose of this petition. It's to ask the general public their opinion on whether or not Merrimack should be turned into a sanctuary city. When the general public in those towns found out what the elected officials had done, they were livid and most of the town councilmen were immediately voted out of office, of course. Around the world, Socialists and communists have been in cahoots with organized crime and international human trafficking organizations, and it's impossible to ignore the outside political clout of organized crime even in our country's history. Uh, even the Communist Party USA again reiterated its support for sanctuary cities and ordered members serving in local offices and act activists to continue to push this policy, referring to illegal immigrants as, quote, undocumented workers, unquote, and even allies allies against whom I've been asking, and I have not gotten answers even up in Concord. Most are not workers, and many have false documents. The illegal alien from Venezuela who recently murdered Lakin Riley, a 22-year-old American nursing student in, at Augusta University, he wasn't working. His brother, also an illegal from Venezuela, was working illegally with falsified documents. Max, so, you want to wrap it up, please? Okay, I'll just last sentence here. Millions of illegal illegals have fraudulent documents or have made friends in City Hall who make them in other parts of the country. Millions more have gamed the welfare system, joined criminal gangs, filed frivolous and fraudulent lawsuits, traffic in illegal narcotics, etc. Police officers who are pulling someone over or dealing with someone who they think might be dangerous need to be able to do their job without interference uh, from the top down. So this petition is, is a question. It's not binding in court. It's, it's just asking the public for their uh, Thank their you. opinion on the issue. I'm going to step in here for just a minute. A number of people have expressed an opinion that they are going to present a, uh, an amendment. I'm going to ask if rather than going, if we're not going to leave this the way it is, if we're going to amend it, let's, let's deal with amendments first and then we can go back to it if we need to. So uh, an amendment, please. I would Good evening. Uh, my name is George Dieter. I live at 17 Dunstable Circle here in Merrimack. And I'm proposing an amendment to uh, this article to replace it with the following language. The Merrimack Police Department shall maintain standard operating principles consistent with the New Hampshire State Police fair and impartial policing practices. Thank you. So we're going to talk about amending this petitioned article, and I will read it again for everybody. The wording in the petitioned article that you have in your booklet is going away in its entirety, and it's going to be replaced with Merrimack Police Department shall maintain standard operating procedures consistent with New Hampshire State Police fair and impartial policing practices. 
You want to speak to this? I have a second. Thank you. The purpose of the following standard, of following standard operating procedures is to prevent potential bias policing and other discriminatory practices in any law enforcement related activity involving the officers of the Merrimack Police Department. While this policy is intended to ensure that the department members honor the human and constitutional rights of those whom they come in contact with, nothing in this directive shall be construed to prevent department members from engaging in lawful police activity, including the ascertaining of identities of people lawfully detained or arrested or to conform or dispel reasonable suspicions concerning any violations of criminal law. Thank you. Thank you. When do you want to speak to the amendment? Yes, I do. Uh, for the record again, Wendy Thomas, uh, Wildcat Falls. Unlike the original warrant article, this amendment does not mandate that the Merrimack Police Department do the federal government's bidding with respect to federal immigration enforcement without any funds for training, compliance, and litigation costs. Enforcing federal immig immigration detainees is problematic and may, be, and may even force the Merrimack Police Department to violate Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment rights which creates exposure for Merrimack taxpayers. This is because immigration detainees are not arrest warrants. Unlike criminal warrants, which are supported by a judicial determination of probable cause, ICE detainees are issued by ICE enforcement agents themselves without any authorization or oversight by a judge or other neutral decision maker. Moreover, it is well settled that a person's presence in the United States in violation of immigration laws, standing alone is not a crime. Im immigration violations are generally civil, not criminal in nature. In short, the original article is a mandate that local police do the work of the federal government concerning federal civil immigration enforcement all without funds for training and compliance and with exposure to lawsuits that will force communities to spend money for lawyers for violations of its broad terms. This amendment eliminates those concerns. It is for these reasons that I support the, appro the, the proposed amendment to Article 12. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Madam Andy? Education. My understanding is an amendment to an article, the subject of the article has to remain. And the subject is remaining. We're talking about police enforcement. So, so the, even though it's in quotation, there's sanctuary cities is not the subject of this? No. Okay. Thank you. Max? So this is the second time. Um, and I'll say the same thing that I said last week. Uh, over 50 people signed this citizen's petition. Uh, people who've lived in town their whole lives, they overwhelmingly agreed with it. Almost everyone I even mentioned this to signed the petition. They understand what the intent is, that we don't want to have our town changed into a sanctuary city or, or to have our police being told that they're not allowed to uh, contact federal officials or that they're not even allowed to enforce an immigration detainer request. I was recently told the other day by the police chief that he doesn't allow the uh, uh, enforcement of immigration detainer requests, that if they get them, they disregard them and send the person on their way. That's what I was told, uh, you know, person to person. And so on one hand, I've been told when I moved, uh, when I moved here to pe by people that there was no way that that would ever happen that that couldn't happen, that that's impossible to happen, that this is the last place on earth where that that would happen. And then I was told by the police chief himself that that, that, that does happen. Now, admittedly, the citizen's petition is just, a, is just a question for the voters to get their input. But the effect of the amendment, the effect of the amendment is to, would to ta be to take away the ability of the 50, 60 some odd people who signed the petition to put this question in front of the voters and, and get their input. Uh, people have the right to debate it, people have the right to discuss the issue, 
but I don't think that there's any question that the proposed uh, rewriting has absolutely no impact whatsoever. It, it doesn't leave any question open to the voters. It takes the question off the ballot and just puts a, a bland, meaningless uh, uh, sentence there that has no impact whatsoever. I don't think that this would hold up in court. Thank you. Rosemary? Thank you, Rosemary Rung, 21 Ministerial Drive. Max brought up last week. That petition warrant article brought in from extreme political elements was resoundly rejected last, last week and replaced. Merrimack is not a town that's going to be a toy for these extreme political elements to come in and try to force their agenda on us. Um, additionally, where are migrants going to live? How could they afford the rent in Merrimack? Um, you know, Rosemary it just doesn't was, make sense. We're I'm sorry, to the petition. but I do have a question. I do have a question. Since this is involving the police, I was wondering if the town manager or the police chief could comment on whether the amendment is something that they would support, something that you know is consistent with how they operate their department. Thank you. The Merrimack Police Department does fair and impartial policing currently, and they follow the laws and statutes of the state of New Hampshire. So that's what they currently okay, do. So, the, so we're good to go then, thank you. We, we, have, we have two more speakers here and then I'm gonna call for a vote on the... One more vote, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Anthony Santorello, Five Hartwood. Uh, so, respectfully, I believe that the uh, proposed amendment really does miss the spirit of what was proposed. It uh, doesn't fit. My reading of the original article was specifically that we should not, shall not establish any policies that prevent law enforcement from being able to force the laws that they believe make sense. The original is about we, let's not constrain law enforcement and prevent them from making decisions that they believe make sense. This other version doesn't speak to any of those constraints, what they can and cannot do based on their own professional judgment. So I think that it really does miss the point. And unfortunately, I also think that the very vague language about you know fair and impartial and this kind of thing, like the sad reality is that in any society, whether far left or far right or for green or purple or whatever, like any society with any agenda and any bias could stand behind that statement and do whatever it is that they want to do and believe that they're following it. So uh, I would vote against the amendment to give people the opportunity to allow police to make the decisions that they see fit and enforce the laws as written according to their professional judgment. Thank you very much. I'll read the amendment or the proposed amendment one more time. Merrimack Police Department shall maintain standard operating procedures consistent with New Hampshire State Police fair and impartial policing practices. We are voting as to whether or not you want to replace what's in the printed article with this verbiage. All those in favor of changing the verbiage, raise your cards please. Thank you very much. All those opposed to changing it. And the amendment failed. I, I'm sorry, the amendment passes. Any, any further discussion on this article? I did. I can see all the cards. We do this normally at every meeting, so. Just a question. Yes. Uh, parliamentary inquiry, what was the count on that? I did not count the hands. I, sh I had a show which tells me roughly how many, and there were more cards held up for passing it than there were for failing it. Okay, I, I just, I just want to make a point of, 
I just want to make a point of information that it looked to me like they're about this. It looked to me like it looked to me like there were the same number of cards held up on both both votes. I think the, that it, it, it was close, but like I said, standing here where I can see everything, that's the way I counted it. Um, I, have, I have a well. Okay, I have a parliamentary inquiry. Can I ask for a count? We can. I'm gonna. Well, you don't need that. Um, I'm gonna ask my moderators. I'm gonna have someone. Steve, you want to take this section? Who have we got over here? Leah, would you count the stage? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. The bleachers. And where's Pat? Pat, would you count this section? So you're going to, all those in favor of passing the amendment, hold your cards up, please, and keep them held up till we've got an answer. Leah, do you have a number? Just come and give it to Brian, please. All right, all those, I, I got these guys here. All of those, put your cards down, all those opposed to this petition, this uh, proposed amendment, you want to leave the language the way it was. Hold your cards up, please. Keep your cards up. Okay, you can put your cards down. There are 92 in favor of the proposed amendment and 51 against. So the we are now addressing the article as it has been amended. Is there anyone else who wants to speak to this? Wolf, you heading here? Go ahead. Heather Robitraille, 45 Springfield Circle. I just wanted to say I am in favor of this article as it is amended. I have full faith and confidence that the fine men and women of our police department here in Merrimack uphold our community and values and they serve us with honor and they do their duty and do not need to be interfered with any type of petitions. They are here to comply with laws that are set from immigration on a federal level. This is also something being heard in the state. So I support our officers and thank them for the service. Thank you. One more speaker. Go ahead, Wolf. Wolf well, von Schoen for Conservation Drive. Um, I had a lengthy discussion with the chief actually today about this and one of his, uh, actually the chief deputy, deputy chief, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and my are there. What's that? Yeah, right. Uh, actually, I think he is, but my understanding is really in, in this that neither the voter nor the federal government can delegate jurisdiction to Merrimack police. And I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. And I'm not a lawyer by any means, but that's my understanding. Neither the voter nor the federal government can delegate jurisdiction to the local police. 
And uh, I recommend that voters look up the ACLU case that the town lost, actually, um, because um, Merrimack police detained upon request by ICE um, uh, two illegal uh, citizens, well, two illegal people here in town, and uh, ended up uh, getting sued for it and lost the case. So um, while I understand the notion of the original article and, and the petition, uh, I think we have to understand that there's limitations as far as what the voter can really achieve here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I said one more. We're going to add one small thing here. Small. Thank you. It took me a while to get over here, sorry. That's all right. Like I said, I've been there, done that. Uh, again, Greg Miller, uh, speaking in my own personal capacity, uh, one hand to drive. Uh, I think there's a misunderstanding of the original uh, thing, especially the, the previous lady that just spoke, is the bill was to protect the law enforcement from people that don't have that law enforcement experience making or tying their hands for them. So it took it out of the, the power of a board and left it with the police department. We just took it away from the police department and gave it to the state police. So now if we vote this in, if the state police all of a sudden make their ethics and standards to make us a sanctuary city or not make us a sanctuary city, we're leaving it to them. We're not leaving it to us as a town. It, it doesn't Thank make you. sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this article will move to the ballot as amended. And for my last time, I'm going to entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Lon. And again, thank you, Merrimack voters. You're the best ones in the state. Thanks for watching Merrimack TV's live coverage of the town's deliberative session 2024. I'm Nick Lissel Valley, the town of Merrimack's media services coordinator. Uh, I worked alongside our assistant media services coordinator, Justin Slez, and our media assistant back at Town Hall, Grace LeMay. Thanks for watching Merrimack TV, whether you're watching on our cable channel or you've downloaded our app, we appreciate you watching. You can download Merrimack TV on your Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire TV device. It's also available on your iPhone and Android as well. Uh, on April 9th is election day. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. If you're not sure where to vote, you can go to merrimacknh.gov and you can find your polling location. On election day, beginning at 7 p.m., we will broadcast our election night live special. We begin at 7 p.m. with special election night programming, show you some selections from Merrimack High School concerts uh, and some additional content that we've produced. Uh, we're so thankful that you tuned into Merrimack TV tonight. And if you want to uh, stay in touch with us, please follow us on social media. Go to facebook.com slash Merrimack TV. Uh, Merrimack TV covers not only your board and committee meetings, uh, and for two decades we've been covering deliberative session, but we also cover Merrimack High School varsity Tomahawks games, uh, concerts, and other community events. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight, and I hope that you download the Merrimack TV app. Uh, and remember to vote on April 9th. Again, if you're unsure of your polling location, merrimacknh.gov. Thanks for watching Merrimack TV, your community, your voice. <laughs>